Welcome to Turn a Wood Bowl. In the previous episode, I turned the exterior of this great big bowl blank. This is about a 80 pound, 19 or 18 inch diameter pecan green wood bowl blank. We turned the exterior and shaped that in the previous video, so you're going to want to check that out. Also, we took the center of this lathe apart in that first video. If you're curious about that, make sure you see that first video. In this video, we're going to turn away the interior and finish up this bowl. First thing I want to do is take my 5 8 inch bowl gouge and clear off some of this bark. Bark is really thick and heavy and is difficult for the cutting edge to get through. So we want to remove some of this. Plus, I want to level off that center so that the bowl blank turns a little more balanced and not be so out of balance or irregular shaped. Just using a simple push cut from left to right to get across that thicker or that under bark. Now, if you've seen any of my other videos, you know that I like to work from the wall area outward. Actually, I was taking a little bit too big of a bite there. I am just roughing material out, so I was taking a little bit too thick of a cut, and it actually caused the lathe belt to slip a little bit there. Okay, so once I've got some material removed away from the top rim, what I'm going to do is my half-inch 55-degree bevel swept back bull gouge, I'm going to start establishing the wall thickness. The way I do that is I make sure that the bowl gouge bevel is parallel with the exterior of the bowl and just follow that around. Now I've got a little bit of an extending rim here that I've, I'm actually cutting. I'm they're cutting a lot of air there and you can see that. But I'm basically just guiding the bevel around to follow the contour of the exterior of the bowl. And then I'll nibble some material away. It's kind of like working out a little trough. And then I will continue that same wall thickness as I go down into the bowl. The importance of that center mass is for stability. With any bowl, especially a big bowl like this with green wood, if I were to core out that center first and just work up to the thin walls of this, I would have a lot of flexing and it would be almost impossible to turn very smoothly. But because of that big core in the center, I've got added stability that allows me to keep that wall relatively thin. Now, when I say thin, for a bowl this size, that, that wall is going to be somewhere near a half inch or like a, over a centimeter thick which is not super thin, but for a bowl this size, that's pretty thin. I want it to be functionally thin. If I got into a really light, thin, thin bowl, then it's going to not function very well. And if you were to put something in it, such as fruit or something like that, it's probably not gonna be very sturdy and can fall over very easily. So what I want is I want something that's functional but appears light and thin. So here you can see I've got about a half inch, maybe just over a centimeter thick wall established and I'll just keep working down that wall and I will lower the center mass as I go but as I do that I don't return back up that wall for anything so I want to take my time and make sure that I get that wall thickness right where I want it without needing to go back and fuss with it I kind of think of it as like sneaking up on the the, the desired thickness I'm making really light cuts here just real simple light passes and here you see me back up a bit and what I'm doing there is I'm just merging the previous cut to the current area. You're going to want to stop the lathe frequently too and check that wall thickness. In this particular area I can still reach it with my finger so I can feel that thickness and everything's feeling pretty good. Later I'm going to need to be using a gauge so I can feel and check the thickness of those walls down deeper into the bowl. 
So I'm just using a push cut to the left. I've got the bowl gouge oriented at about the 10, 10 30 position, doing a push cut, removing some of that center mass. And I'll remove it down to the area where I'm going to start working on the wall again. That way I've got stability in the area that I'll be turning along that wall. Okay, this tool rest, and my standard 12 inch tool rest, is not quite reaching where I need it to reach. So I'm going to be using my longer 14 inch J tool rest. I'll put links to all of these in the description below. I like to do that with all of my videos as well. I've got the tools that I'm using in the video linked in the description. You can check those out. I'm just going to bring that center mass down and I'm going to work an area along the wall here and take that wall down a little bit more. You want to stand upright and be paying attention to the exterior shape of that bowl while you're making these cuts as well. This is where you can get into trouble if you make a cut too deep and you start and you thin that wall down too far down into that bowl. That's why another method, another reason why this method works so well is you're basically just working small sections at a time and patiently working through each section until you get the thickness the way you want it and then proceeding to the next section. All right, starting to, starting to take shape really nicely there, and I don't need this center mass to be as tall as it is. I, I need to reduce it also so that I have better access into the lower portions of the bowl. The lathe speed's been increased. I don't have an RPM readout to tell you what the lathe speed is, and that's actually a good thing. I've got a video all about lathe speed if you want to check that out. and. In that video, I'll explain to you why, depending on your RPM readout, isn't necessarily the best thing. Instead, you really need to be paying attention to the way the piece is turning. So I'll put a link up above. Check out that video. I can't get over the, the heartwood grain of this wood is just gorgeous. This is southern pecan. It was a pretty big tree. It's about uh, two about two feet in diameter at the base, just over half a meter. And it was it was a large tree, and there were some really nice chunks that were able to get out of that, which was very very nice. And these are just ripping cuts. We're just roughing this material out. We're not trying to make really smooth cuts here. I'm using my half inch bowl gouge here. I have both a half inch and a 5 8 inch bowl gouge that I use interchangeably. Usually I'm using the 5 8 inch bowl gouge to rough out material and then the half inch bowl gouge which you see, see here, I use that for finishing cuts. But technically they can both be used interchangeably. Essentially the half inch bowl gouge makes a smaller cut. So when you're making a smaller cut, it slows your it slows your cutting pace down. It makes you focus a little bit more and you typically get a better finish. So it, the smaller bowl gouges are used for finishing cuts. However, you could take the 5 8 inch bowl gouge and make a nice finishing cut too. You just have to really slow down your pace and make a nice light cut. All right, we're back to the sharpening station. If you want to learn all about how to sharpen and shape your tools, then check out my tool sharpening online e-course. In that course, I'll show you how to shape all the different bowl gouge profiles and how to sharpen them, along with all of the other tools that you'll be using when turning a wood bowl. It's actually a really, really important step in bowl turning and the best part of that course is once you've taken it and you learned how to sharpen your tools it makes all of your turning experiences that much more enjoyable because you're not struggling with dull tools you 
You can be a great turner, but if you have dull tools, you're not going to accomplish anything. And if you're just get starting out learning how to turn with dull tools, you're going to be incredibly frustrated. And that's why sharpening tools are so important. You take that element out of the equation and just practice your turning techniques. You'll get good very fast. However, if you're turning with dull tools, you're not going to know whether it's the tool that's causing the problem or if it's your technique. So again, you just take that whole element out of the equation by learning how to sharpen properly. And I mentioned in the first video of this, because of the size of this bowl blank, that cutting edge is being used a lot. I mean, we're talking miles and miles of rubbing on that sharpening edge. So I'm turning, in, in this particular turning, I'm sharpening that, the bowl gouges about every 10 minutes. I've, several times I've gone back to the sharpening station and the CBN wheels are still spinning from when I turned them off the last time because it was it was only a few minutes and they were dull. Okay, I'm gonna use my depth gauge here. This is a really cool depth gauge. It's actually like a plunge, it's like a plunge stick that leaves a gap at the top. So if you look at my right hand there, there's a little gap. And that gap basically illustrates the thickness of the wall in the particular area where you happen to be touching. I'll put a link to that depth gauge in the description below along with all the other tools. So I'm looking at the right side. If you see my right hand there, I'm looking at the gap between the blue section and the top of the piece. Right up there, there's a little gap in the middle. That's what I'm looking for and then I'm trying to make sure that that gap stays consistent. There you can see the gap as I'm moving the tool around the wall of the bowl. Okay, everything's looking good. I just need to clear away this center mass down into the bottom of the bowl. There's a lot of wood here. I, I could have cored this out and made a second bowl, but I, I'm comfortable with what I've got here and I'm, I'm happy with turning this the, the standard way. And you can't, I guess you can make bowls endlessly. I mean, if you really wanted to, you could have cored out several bowls from this, but it becomes a little bit overkill after a while. This particular bowl in its OG shape didn't didn't necessarily lend itself well to being cored out. The cored bowl out of this would have been relatively small. And I would have had that center mass gone as well. It would have it wouldn't have given me the option to go as thin with the wall thickness as I would have liked to instead of using the method that I'm using right now. A little center can be a booger sometimes to get the bevel to engage with. This is exactly the same method that I used all the way down the bowl. Basically about an inch and a half or two inch section I'll push across there and clean it off and then just kind of sneak up on that wall thickness. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm just taking from the area on the outside that's already established the wall thickness and just sneaking up on it again. And then we'll go ahead and stop and check that again. I've also adjusted the breaking speed for the lathe and brought it back to a faster stop because this bowl blank is much lighter now. <laughs> if you can see, there's my shop is completely filled with shavings and the weight of the bowl are in those shavings and not in this piece anymore. That bowl blank was very heavy.
And again, this is where you really want to take your time. Don't rush through this because just feeling like you're getting it right and then if you go too far, then it's you can't undo that. All the time and effort that you put into this so far will be for naught if you overcut this, this particular area. Now, I'm feeling an area up there that's a little bit open. I have the flute... I am sorry, a little bit, an area there that's a little bit thick, and I had the flute open. That's what I wanted to share with you. When I have the flute that open, you can see I'm almost at the 12 o'clock position. I have to be really careful to take very light cuts and not let the right side of the bull gouge touch that center mass. If I touch that center mass and engage the left and the right side with the flute completely open, I'm going to get a nasty catch. I think I call all the catches nasty catches. I think that's because they're all nasty catches. I don't think there's any nice catches. <laughs> anyway, so you just want to make sure that you're only engaging the left side of the bull gouge. And it's a very light cut when you have that flute open. It, that's just a finishing refined cut. I'm at about the one o'clock position here as I'm making these passes and then continuing the base of that bull. Again, checking, checking, checking. If you like this video, do me a huge favor and click that like button below the screen. It helps this video and helps the whole channel. And I greatly appreciate you clicking that and I appreciate you. Thank you. And there's still a little bit of a troubled area there. Again, very light cut there. And I'm not sensing a lot of vibration at the moment. I'm getting a good clean cut there, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. If I went all the way up to the rim right now, there's no way I can make that cut because it's going to be vibrating like crazy up there. And you can see what I was doing. I was actually pulling backwards and just rubbing the bevel onto the surface so I could feel a change in the surface where that thick area was and then changing direction and cutting over the top of that. All right, now it's time to remove that center. The only trick here is I'm really extended down into this bowl with the tool rest and this bowl gouge. What I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to a different tool here in just a second. It's time for the micro bevel. <laughs> if you don't know about the micro bevel, then it's time you figure that out because the micro bevel is a great secret weapon and it's perfect in this situation. I'm using a 5 8 inch bull gouge. So it's thick and it has stability because sometimes I have to overreach the tool rest and that extension can create vibration with a smaller tool. So you want a, a larger tool like a 5 8 inch bull gouge. But the micro bevel profile on this allows me to turn with the bull gouge positioned almost straight into the bull blank. I've got a video all about the micro bevel. You're going to want to check that out. I'm putting a link up on the screen for you right now. The micro bevel is one of those tools you don't use it that often, but when you need it, it's a wonderful thing to have on hand. This is a perfect situation for it. It's finishing off the bottom curve of this particular bowl. This has a 65 degree bevel. And the bevel is wrapped around the entire nose of that. So you got to be careful not to engage the sides too much. But you can see how I'm cutting up onto the left side. If you watch closely at the at the bevel of this tool, you can see exactly where it's cutting. It's centered there, and then it goes up onto the left side just a little bit. But you don't want to get up onto the wing itself. And then the other aspect of this bull gouge is the heels are ground back. There's two heels on this, so that there's a very thin or micro bevel up along the top edge, and that's what's doing the cutting. With the heels removed, it's able to make really tight curves and get into the bottom of a bowl just like this really easily without rubbing or getting 
interrupted in any way when you're making the passes. Now I'm getting there, but I can see there's obviously a flat spot. So I got to keep removing material to get that flat spot out of there. And visually, I'm looking across the bowl just as I was on the exterior, which I illustrated in the first video. I'm not looking necessarily at the tool. I'm looking at the other side of the bowl. I'm looking up where the cut's being made over to the right in this case. And I'm merging that curve of the interior with the shape that I'm trying to create now. I've got to be careful with that rim. Okay, so now it's time to sand. This piece is relatively wet. And what I did is I left it sit on the lathe for about a half hour and let the surfaces dry a bit. But it can still be sanded beautifully, even though that the wood still contains a lot of moisture. What I do is I work through the grits. I start with um, 180 and I'm turn with the lathe on. And then I go through and I hand sand the center, never turn the center with the lathe running. I've got a video all about sanding bowls. If you want to check that out, that's a really important video. Go ahead and check that out. I'll put a link above for you. The edges need to be cleaned up by hand. Any trouble area should be hand sanded like you're seeing. I'm only using the side of the disc. I'm not using the whole disc. And I'm sanding in line with the grain of the wood. So I'll work through the grits. I'll go through 180 to 240 to 320 on both the exterior and the interior. I won't be sanding the rim at all because that's a natural edge, live live edge, bark rim. There would be no point to sand that. If, if all the bark were removed, I've sanded edges like that and kept those perpendicular to the bowl and those look pretty well, but this is all natural, so we'll leave that edge. What I'm looking for here is any scratch marks that go against the wood grain. I'm just going to lightly rub the edge of the sanding mandrel across those and remove them. Okay, with the bowl sanded, I can take it off the lathe. I'm going to switch chucks here. I'm going to go to my medium sized chuck here. And I'm going to install a jam chuck. This is kind of a universal jam chuck. I use this one for all sorts of different size bowls. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put a piece of padding between the jam chuck and the bowl, and then I'm going to bring the tail stock up and essentially pin the bowl between the jam chuck and the tailstock. From the beginning, when I had the tailstock on the lathe, there's a little mark. So I'm lining up to match that mark. What you can do is you basically hold your thumb in one location and find the high spot, loosen the tailstock, and move the bull just a touch if it's not turning very true. Take a little time and you'll get that set up. It's not going to ever turn perfectly true, especially with green wood, because in the entire time that this has been turned, it's moving a lot as well. Okay, if you remember in the first part of this bowl turning in the first video, I shared with you that the tenon and the shoulder will become part of the, the bowl or the foot. And here's a perfect example of how this is all shaping out. I want the foot to appear smaller on this than the tenon was. I don't want to make it too small because then the bowl will be wobbly. But I don't want it to appear big and heavy and clunky. However, while I'm turning the bowl, I need that tenon to be relatively large and proportioned properly so that the bowl is properly supported on the lathe. So 
we turn with the bowl tenon and the shoulder knowing that they can be reshaped at the end and that's getting really close right there as I'm removing this tenon I'm looking over the top of the bowl and I'm looking at the opposite side at the profile of the shape if you look at the tool you're not going to see the shape very well. It's kind of like riding a bicycle and staring at your feet on the pedals. You're not going to be riding in a very straight line, most likely. Instead, look across the top of the bowl and look at the shape that you're creating on the opposite side. All right. I'm liking that. So I'll take a moment and sand that whole area now and sand it down to the 320 grit, just as the other areas or, and I'm using the same technique where I'll sand with the lathe running and then I'll go around and look for trouble areas and I'll sand that all the way down to 320. So what I'm going to do here is I want the foot to be approximately the same thickness as the wall of the bowl, about a half inch. And I'm going to do a very simple concave center area in the bottom of this foot. Using the bull gouge, I'm just pushing across and making a nice kind of cupped concave area in the base of this foot. And then I'll nibble away the nub that's attached to the tailstock. There's a dark area on that nub. I, I'm stopping the lathe to make sure, okay, that's just coloration. It's not a void. If there was a, a negative space there or a void, that would make this pretty dangerous at this point and I would want to stop at this point. If you're not comfortable turning beyond this point, you can stop right now. That nub will sand down. You can also cut it off if you want and you can sand that area. What I like to do is I'll use my spindle detail gouge and I'll continue taking that nub down pretty small and then I'll pick up the curve in the center Just kind of take your time and, and whittle it down. And then I'm going to push into it and turn the lathe off. And that will cut through those fibers and separate that nub. And there's the separation. So the bowl is turned. I need to sand the area where that nub was at the base. And that can be done with sanding with the grain using the side of the sanding pad lined up with the grain fibers. I'll sand on one side, but then I'll take the bowl and I'll rotate it around. What I've found is if you don't rotate the bull around and do both sides, you'll have a divot in there of some sort. And by rotating it around, it balances it out very nicely. All right, now it's time to sign the bull. I use a wood burning pen with a chisel point just because that's how I like to sign. There are pin points that are available. I'll put link, a link to the burning tool down in the bottom in the description of this video. When I was in college in the summers, I worked at a sign painting company and we used sign painting brushes and we pulled letters just like this. So I'm kind of used to doing that and it's, it's kind of funny because I, I don't mind doing this, but it takes a little time. Okay, I'm gonna use Danish oil to finish this. This is tried and true brand Danish oil. And the reason I like this Danish oil is it is made of linseed oil and that's it. Nothing else. And when I say nothing else, I mean absolutely nothing else. Nothing nothing hidden or unseen. Nothing. It's There's no dryers. There's no chemicals. There's no heavy metals. There's nothing in this other than linseed oil. And this company makes some great products. My other favorite of their of uh, their finishes is the tried and true original which is this same linseed oil with beeswax in it the oil that i'm using now is a very thin i'm just going to put a very thin coat on this wood is green so what does that mean 
essentially what I'm doing is I'm somewhat sealing the wood, although the wood will still breathe and the moisture will still escape this wood. It's slowing that process, which is actually really good because we don't want the, the moisture to escape too quickly. If the moisture escapes too quickly from some areas but not others, that's how cracking forms because you have a differentiation in the surfaces. The oil helps hold that moisture in for just a little bit longer and it's going to actually dull. As it's drying, the, this oil finish will dull. I'll need to apply several coats to make this bowl look really nice, which I don't have a problem with. This is going to look really, really nice once this is complete. But it's going to look very similar to what you're seeing right now once it's dried completely and I've applied multiple coats of this oil. I got to tell you, I'm very happy with the finish, how this bowl turned out. The rim exterior and that open OG shape is just, it's just turned out really, really nice. I love the feel of it. I can't get over that heartwood color and the pattern on the inside is absolutely gorgeous. This is why I turn bowls and this is why I share it with you guys because for this, I love, I love the way things happen and you don't know what they're going to be until you finish them. <laughs> I hope you guys like this. All right, guys, I got to tell you, that was a lot of fun. It's actually a lot lighter, too. <laughs> it's about a half inch thick all the way around. It's not super thin, but it's usable. This is a great fruit bowl, great centerpiece. It's going to be a, a beautiful piece on a tabletop. I'm really happy with the way it turned out. Now, again, this is once turned. This is wet, and it's going to shape and distort a little bit as it dries. But a half inch wall thickness really won't see that much movement. And with this nice, irregular edge all the way across the top we really won't see that that movement too much with our eyes so all in all it turned out to be a great piece uh, I think all of that weight that I was carrying initially is now swept up and is going to be composted and used to fill holes in the yard all right, guys, I hope you liked this video. If you did, do me a huge favor and click that like button below the screen right now. That helps out this video and the whole channel, and I greatly appreciate you clicking that like button. Thank you. If you're not subscribing, please subscribe and click that bell so you'll be notified when my new videos come out. I got tons of videos, and I want to share them with you guys, so make sure you're subscribing. Thank you so much for watching, and like always, until next time, happy turning. Thank <laughs> you.